Hi Franz. Greg, how are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah, it's been a long time since our last video. It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, interested in the hysterical world wending its way, mm. hopefully to some better state somewhere along the line. Yes. Well, today uh, I'm excited to jump into uh, chapter three, which is called uh, Rain Seeking in your book, South Africa Can Work. Uh, if people aren't familiar with the book already, uh, you can, I suppose, start uh, on the first video that we put out. Um, and yeah, you can, the book's available to buy online. Um, and it's obviously a really great read. And today, yeah, we're going to ex be exploring chapter three, which is called Rent Seeking. So, France, before I, I start with my, with my questions, is there anything you want to you wanna say? Well... I suppose the logical starting place is to say what what is rent seeking. Um, mm. It's not a concept or a word or a phrase with which everyone is familiar. Mm. Uh, it's an economic term and it comes from the old feudal system when the landlords uh, were criticized by, well subsequently criticized by people like Adam Smith incidentally, uh, for the fact that they were simply drawing rent from other people who farm their land and that was somehow seen as uh, uh, open to criticism and not commendable uh, and as a result of that uh, the, the, the asking for rent by a landlord has become a uh, subject of criticism. That term has now become uh, differently used uh, in the sense of anyone who is getting something for nothing. Mm. Uh, the South African expression is the old gravy train uh, that we, we all get aboard, we get the benefits, but we don't put in the work. Mm. Uh, in economic terms, I think the best expression uh, to use is to link it to productivity or a lack of productivity. Uh, whenever somebody is doing something which is not either productive at all or is insufficiently productive compared to that which uh, they get out, the benefit. Uh, there's a mismatch between the benefit and the productivity that is put in. Yeah, and, uh, that's open to criticism. You say here on uh, page 31, um, you say, you write, the economist describes rent-seeking as cutting yourself a bigger slice of the cake rather than making the cake bigger. I mean, that's quite a nice, simple way of... Yeah, that's, that's a good way of, of putting it. If you want a bigger slice of the cake, you actually have to grow the cake first. Mm. Uh, you've got to put in the productive work, the production. And that's the best way of, of, of thinking about it, is, 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 is production. And we'll come back to, to various examples, I'm quite sure. But that's uh, the, the economist's definition. And, and you find an application in in all kinds of uh, spheres, but the, 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 the good one which I also quote there is the, the trade union example. Mm. The, the, the trade unions increase the income for their workers by whatever means, normally by calling a strike, uh, and as a result of that the wages of their members will go up, but their productivity will not necessarily go up. In fact, the employer loses twice. The, so they 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 want more of the cake, but they're not necessarily adding. They're not the adding cake. adding to the cake. So so, mm -hmm. in a way, they they're getting something for nothing. Right, so. and 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 uh, obviously this is a. I mean, to people familiar with the book and f familiar with the videos that we've made so far, um, they'll they'll know that um, rent seeking is a major theme in the in the book. Uh, why why. Why is this such a big part of um, the book's philosophy and, mm. and, and a big and, and also why have, have, do we not discuss rent seeking more? Why don't we hear about it more in the mainstream? Yeah, it's I suspect uh, what I what I realized somewhere along the line, I thought about it for a long time and I tried to identify the golden thread that runs through the South African problems, the malaise of what is wrong here. Right. And uh, that is my way of identifying that golden thread, is to, 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 to call it 
uh, rent seeking. Mm. Uh, we talk about these things, but I think it's important that we see the common ground amongst all these various kinds of rent seeking. What is it that makes that they have in common that binds them together? Mm. Because that, if we can identify that, that will enable us then to address the tendency. Uh, and, and I will show to you by way of examples how a whole variety of problems in South Africa are all manifestations of that same golden thread. And that's why it's so important to me. I want to show to people that there's a common theme. And if we, if we realize that, then we can, we can address the individual problems. Because what people tend to do is they tend to tackle these problems ad hoc. They mm. want to tackle education in one way. They want to tackle labor in another way. They want to tackle uh, race problems in another way. And in the end, if you can identify that they all have one common underlying cause, right. then maybe we should start working on that. I see. So on page 32, you say, uh, you, I keep saying you say, you write, uh, I believe a culture of rent seeking is central to most, if not all, of our greatest problems. Corruption, race, conflict, educational decline, unemployment, and economic stagnation, which is kind of what you said now. So it's a sort of common thread. Yeah. And then you say, if rent seeking is wrong, what is right? So. Mm. We've identified what rent seeking is, why mm. it's wrong. What is sort of the opposite? The of opposite of rent seeking is, 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 is another word which people are probably more familiar with, mm. and that is merit. What okay. we do when we when we doing the right thing is we actually put in the productivity. Mm. Uh, if a worker works, he is then rewarded by way of a wage which is commensurate with his productivity. So he gets something, he puts something in, and he gets back, which is fair, that which is fair and commensurate with the effort and the productivity that he's put in. And not only effort, because the employer pay, doesn't pay for effort, the employer pays for product, productivity. That's what he wants. Mm. He wants output. Um, and the and, and employee cannot expect to get uh, his side of the bargain unless he puts in the commensurate productivity on the other. So that's merit. And, and merit can then be applied to all spheres of life. For example, education. Mm -hmm. uh, our education system is a very good example of not having merit. Mm -hmm. Our education system is one where pupils, as I say, uh, pretend to study and the employers pretend, or the teachers rather, pretend to qualify them as uh, Matriculants. Yes, you, uh, you said um, in the chapter there's something uh, like it was a Soviet. It was a joke in Soviet Russia. Sad. Is that is that the one you? That's the one. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a it's a play plagiar, the, plagiarism of, of that. The students idea. pretend to learn and the teachers and pretend to to, 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 to qualify. qualify them. Okay. And uh, the workers in, in in Soviet Russia used to pretend to work, and the employers to pretended to pay them. So. Uh, the, the contrary is to ask, what is the purpose of the exercise? What, what are we on about? What, why do we engage in this? Why do we engage in education? Why do we engage in uh, work? Because there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, it, 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 the, the, the situation you described where you have people pretending to learn, people almost pretending to teach and qualify, mm -hmm. um, it, it's almost, it's a, it seems a bit like a Monty Python sketch. It's like a, quite farcical. It's, it's almost absolutely false. It's like the blind leading the blind leading the blind and just sort of yeah. this kind of a strange twilight zone of absolutely. incompetence. And, 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 and we, we, we have a lot of that in South Africa where we go through these charades of pretending to do something uh, and then giving something in return for that which is not really serving the purpose. Mm. Uh, education being the prime example. Uh, the purpose of education is to qualify people to be able to be productive citizens, for which they have to put in the work. Now, if they don't put in the work at school, and we don't set them standards which requires of them to do the work, and we test them with exams mm. which require mm. of them to be tested, to be able to do what they're supposed to do. Um, how do we expect them then to, to comply with the purpose of education? 
They mm. will never be fit to do what they're supposed to do as, as, as qualified uh, pupils uh, or, or learners. Yeah, and, and, and I think the, the great tragedy is that while at home they may feel somewhat buoyant, I don't know, by the, by the, by the, the system that they're in, all you have to do is, is travel to realize just how out of touch people will be in the sort of great international Absolutely game, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, and that's the, those are the standards which we sh should meet. And the same applies to, to our higher education. Uh, our high, higher education should also strive towards uh, the standards that would enable us to compete internationally. And uh, if, we, if we can't fulfill that purpose, we're not complying with the merit principle. So that's really what uh, what rent seeking is about. It's the the obverse of, of merit. You say on the again, I keep saying you say you write on chapter thirty two. You say um, you write, but not mere employment of uh, It manifests the value of human dignity, mm -hmm. an important facet of which is pride and paying your way with your own productive labor. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an interesting point because. That speaks to something quite mysterious and something that's quite hard to mm. educate someone in or teach. It's something that almost uh, is kind of transmitted mm. from your parents or your the community you find yourself in. And yeah. and how, how do we how do we sort of teach people to 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 value the dignity of 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 being productive, of earning your own of your yeah. your well, paying your own way through you productive know, labor. You, you, you know that I am a, a, a strong advocate of saying people are persuaded by experience only. So ultimately, the ideal is that people experience the dignity of productive work. Um, someone else might say that is where meaning is derived from. It's, just, it's your, your, your contribution to the world uh, through making other people's lives more meaningful. By, mm. by assisting, right. you, you're producing something which someone needs. You're a teacher, you teach your, 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 your learners, you're mm. a learner, you, you, you qualify yourself to become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. In that way, you become uh, of meaning to other people. You, you assist other people. You make yes. the suffering a little easier for them. And because of that... Uh, that gives uh, a sense of meaning. Now, another way of phrasing that, and our constitution protects that, is uh, to say that you you have the dignity of, uh, of, of 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 making a contribution. But but there's also a, a, a second dimension, and that is you you have the dignity of self pride. You pay your way. You yeah. you're a, you're a useful uh, contributor to society. Yeah, you can walk with your head. Yeah, you can. You can say, "I'm. I can look after my family. Uh, my own affairs are in order. I pay my way. I'm actually doing something which people need, which is really what the free market is about. It's that ability to pay your way through your way, uh, your your services or your goods, or your labor or your employment." And you make it uh, worthwhile for someone else to to give you something in exchange. Right. Uh, so, so, so dignity is to me a fundamental uh, part of, of, of the the merit principle. Uh, you you write here. It's not hard to see why a country that complies with this merit principle mm. is likely to work as it should. And you yeah. say like you like a finely tuned engine. Mm. So every part in the engine doing its part. Uh, helping to drive the the the, the car forward, um, you write. You, there are no passengers, freeloaders, or parasites. Because mm. in an engine, that's kind of what it is. It's like there's nothing, there's nothing spare. Everything mm. in an engine is is being it's used. It's there last. for a purpose, and it yeah. actually makes a contribution. And and, and and the exciting thing, of course, in a, in a marketplace, uh, which includes the marketplace of ideas, is the fact that we don't know what. You, each person's contribution will be. What part in the engine will he be? But ultimately, uh, there is a part there which uh, most people can fulfill. Mm. And that is uh, what, what a market uh, enables you to do. Because unless you actually fulfill one of those parts where you give value, uh, you're not going to have a role. You have to give value for which people are prepared to pay money. Right. Or, or, or in some other way... Uh, 
exchange with you. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's quite exciting then to think of the potential that A goes missing as a result of the rent-seeking system, because the rent-seeking system is, to come back to where we started, is the one where the productivity that is given in exchange for the benefit is always lacking. Mm. And that is why the machine then becomes uh, stuttering. It, it right. then doesn't work as it's supposed to work because every part or most parts are encouraged by the system to be underproductive. Mm. And then it goes to uh, goes without saying that the machine is not going to operate as it should. Right. Yeah, it's like a car moving forward with a big trailer at the back weighing it down mm. and it's trying to compete with other cars yeah. that are just sort of flying ahead. Or, or, or a, a six-cylinder car that runs on four cylinders or mm. two cylinders. Uh, right. or, or each one just running to half capacity. It doesn't mm. use the full volume of the of the, of, of the of the engine. It, it just uses half of it. Right. It's it's all, all the the uh, fuel that is injected into uh, the engine is, is, is just mixed water down mm. uh, and it's, uh, it's not as productive it's not as going to be as productive so so that's the, 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 the that's the uh, ideal uh, and unless we recognize that I don't think we're going to to come right but I think it's important that we look uh, eventually at the the various examples which I'm sure you're going to get so most people would uh, defend what you're saying and, and, and agree with you that that it's it, that uh, working productively, uh, contributing meaningfully to society, and and being rewarded appropriately um, according to that contribution, is is an ideal state of affairs. Mm. And yet, and yet at the same time, you you write about how people who who would agree with you would also defend certain aspects mm. of uh, rent seeking. Yeah. And then you, you list three. I mean, you, can we go through some of those? Yeah, you see, let, let's start with the ones which are less controversial. Uh, in South Africa, the, I suppose the biggest uh, example of, of rent-seeking we've ever had is state capture. Mm. What happened was that, the, uh, and it's becoming more and more clear as the uh, Zondo Commission is, is, is proceeding with its business, that uh, here was a group of people, a family, who managed to capture the benefits of the state uh, almost entirely without any input. So mm. that was massive. The scale of it was, was big. And there are very few right-thinking people in South Africa on the left or the right of the spectrum who, who, who dare to say at the moment that this is uh, an acceptable form of, of, uh, of, of activity and uh, will not uh, will disagree with the statement that this is a prime example of rent seeking and so you can go down the line uh, corruption uh, in the sense of bribing for example mm -hmm. you get something for nothing you 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 pay an official so you you get a tender you don't get the tender because you're productive enough you get it because you know somebody or you pay enough money or because you're the uncle of the minister who dishes out the tenders. Is that the ten tenderpreneurship? Yeah, that's called tenderpreneurship and that's the sort of uh, accusation you often hear in South African government circles is that right. people people make a living out of uh, making use of their contacts uh, either in the ANC or right. in the government. Uh, and then the, the, the contrary example is... is, is the one where the government again deploys people into jobs, uh, or rather the, the ruling party, mm. uh, which is called cadre de de deployment, which is the same thing. The best people for the job are not put into the position. Yes. So most people will dis will agree with you. This is absolutely uncalled for, and uh, it is unproductive, uh, and it is definitely a reprehensible form of rent seeking. The difficulty comes in where you have uh, examples which are part of the ordinary legal situation in South Africa. They're very much part of the way we do business, legally. Can you give us some... And they have the same uh, effect. Can you give us an example? Yes, well, the one I have already mentioned is uh, labor law. Um, the very purpose of labor law is to increase the cost of labor. Mm. Uh, by improving the benefits 
paid to and otherwise accorded to workers. So a worker who works under the labor laws will have uh, either better minimum wages or the right to do all kinds of things like the right to strike or the right to uh, lengthy uh, procedures uh, for dispute resolution, for example, that he or she would not have had in the absence of that law, which all of which contributes to the increase of the cost. Uh, and which does not necessarily, in fact, it's almost guaranteed to break down the productivity. Right. It does not increase the productivity. So the workers get a bigger benefit. The, the, the classic example is the strike situation. The yeah. employees strike, they get better wages, but they, they don't put in any increased productivity and, and in exchange. You, you wrote in the book that it, that it gives strikers a sort of unreasonable amount of bargaining power, sort of... Yeah, it, 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 it does uh, in the sense that those workers who are in the system, who benefit from it, and they are invariably the stronger set. They mm. are the ones who are better able to command jobs. They, they're normally people with some training or some, some education or some experience, and in any event, better able to compete in the job market than the mass of people outside it. They then command higher wages and higher benefits, more costly benefits, and they then invariably do so because they don't put up the productivity, they do so at the expense of the unemployed. Because right. the unemployed uh, pool then just grows as a result of that. I see. So that is, uh, that is unfair. Other examples would be things like... Uh, Black Economic Empowerment. Uh, yes, that's the one you got, uh, yeah. Or BB, I think the correct phrase is uh, a number of Bs and a number of Es, and it seems like the more complicated it becomes, the more Bs and Es you add. So someone hearing that, might the, the knee-jerk reaction might be one of total disbelief because obviously mm. the mainstream idea is that is that black economic empowerment is a good thing yes. and that any opponents to it are either bigoted in some way or racist and, and mm. there's, there's a lot of negativity attached to opponents of yeah. that. Yeah, so, well, yeah. so how, yeah, how is that an example of, of well, let, Let's just think about it very simply. Uh, the only reason why beneficiaries of black economic empowerment schemes get those benefits uh, as opposed to somebody else getting them uh, in a normal marketplace, is because of the color of their skin. That there, there's no other uh, way of putting this nicely. Mm. Uh, you would not, in many cases, have got that uh, benefit. Otherwise, it would not be necessary. You see, the, the, the thinking behind it is, well, the black people are previously disadvantaged uh, as a result of the lack of education, lack of experience, caused by apartheid, so as a result of that they must get some kind of preferential treatment, which takes the form of either giving them shares in a business, uh, or by giving them an appointment as a director or a managing director, or mm. by uh, employment equity, which is a variety of PBEE, uh, is uh, the, the, the right to, to get promoted to or appointed to a post in the employer employment hierarchy purely uh, because of the color of your skin. Yes, you have to meet certain minimum qualifications. There's no question about that. Yes. But in the case of the employment equity example, you are always going to appoint the second best or the third best. But for the fact that you have employment equity, that person would never be, have been appointed to that position. The reason being, if you, if everybody was uh, qualified, all the black appointees were qualified for the positions and so the best uh, candidate for the position, you would not have needed the legislation. So the fact that you do need it means that all of these uh, beneficiaries are A, appointed to positions to which they cannot present the best productivity that's available, uh, and, uh, and, and they get the benefit. So, 
I, I think what's what's so interesting is is um, that again someone someone might hear that and 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 think um, or, or that you you're sort of implying that there is a kind of uh, inherent difference in the ability to to give oh, uh, to, yeah. to be productive, but again, the the irony is that it just sort of reinforces what you're saying. It mm. it's like if the if the policy is in place, mm. then it speaks for itself. I mean, it's, it's self evident. Why, why? Yeah. Why do you need to appoint people to positions on that basis mm. if, if they were good enough in the first place? But you touch on a very important point there, and that is that that does not mean that black people are inherently incapable of doing the job. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, what it means is that you either recognize the reality, as we have said in previous deliveries right. of these videos, <clears throat> you either honestly admit that the majority of uh, our black population in the workforce are still uh, previously disadvantaged as a result of inferior education and inferior job experience and so forth. Right. Uh, inferior language skills we must never underestimate because of, again, education and coming from a different background where they have not learned certain language skills. As a result of that, uh, we must design the best system to enable them to, to, to improve their lot in the world. And what you do by giving people preferential treatment is the is the worst thing you can possibly do. Mm. Uh, the 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 best thing to 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 enable people to improve is to give them the challenge of actual exposure to the and it was a challenge of merit. Yes. To expose them to to the rears of the marketplace uh, and not give them preferential treatment. So there are a whole lot of spin-offs of this uh, system which. Uh, cause uh, the, the the system to become less productive. Um, uh, an example is, is is the the relationships within the organisation. Uh, people start saying from the employer side or the colleague side, "Yes, why did he get that position? They obviously was appointed to the position because of affirmative action. As a result of that." Uh, we automatically suspect, sometimes wrongly, we suspect that he's less able to do the job, and it also impacts on the attitude of the of the participant. The person who's put in that position says to himself, uh, "Would I have got this job, but for the fact that I am black?" Uh, and uh, the suspicion must lurk uh, underneath the surface all the time. And then uh, there, there's, there's uh, good research on this, that uh, people start behaving according to stereotypical expectations then because of becomes a the self pressure. It becomes a yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, there's good uh, research done in, in the U.S. universities, for example, which is notorious for the fact that people are admitted on a type of a, I almost want to say, a quota system right. where black entrants are required to have less, mm. uh, s lower scores on the SATs, for example. And uh, unfortunately, that starts working on the mind of the participant. Whereas if the, uh, there was a better match between university and student, uh, yeah. that would have been more productive. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like a case of... Um you know, if you say something enough times, eventually people will believe it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it seems like, I mean, one, well, I can only imagine, but if I, but if I was certainly in that kind of position myself and, and surrounded by the, the type of language that, that gets thrown around to describe these particular individuals and mm. describe the, yeah, yeah, I, I can, I can imagine it, uh, Becoming a self-fulfilling mm. prophecy. Yeah, and I feel sorry uh, on on a far far more mundane uh, uh, example, perhaps, but but uh, in in sport, I, I feel really sorry for our black sportsmen because I think we've now reached the stage in South African sport where, and it's difficult. It's more difficult to judge in team sports. It's quite easy to judge in something like athletics. Either you, you, you run the fastest or you don't. So it doesn't really matter. But in team sports where discretion 
of a, a selector is, is the criterion, it becomes really difficult. And I feel sorry because we now have, we know we have quotas in sport. We are told there must be so many black players and then black players of African origin. Uh, quite apart from the fact that it's awkward and insulting and undignified to do that. This is apartheid all over again. Right. Quite apart from that, I find it uh, impossible for those players, A, not to be elect, uh, selected sometimes on the basis of color, and in, in those cases where they are not selected on the basis of color to avoid the suspicion, both in their minds and in the minds of the viewing public and everybody else, that that is precisely why they were selected. Mm. And uh, that's terribly unfair. It is so unfair. It would have been so much better to have exposed all our players to the same rigors of the sports marketplace so that they had, they had to compete. Um, there's a wonderful uh, example which someone came up with and I, I've adapted it to the sports arena. Is, is this idea that if you're an athlete and you've got an injury, Let's suppose even that injury resulted because of foul play. Somebody injured you in a game. Mm -hmm. Now you, you have a horrendous knee fracture or something like that, which you have to rehabilitate. It takes you six months or a year or two years, and you gradually have to work your way back to competitiveness. Can we for a imagine for a moment that that person, which is clearly for, for that juncture a previously disadvantaged person due to injury mm. whatever the reasons are if that player should come to the league and say i want to be back in the league but you must make special provision so if i get the ball uh if i shoot for the goal mm. you must allow me a little bit more space you must run a little slower uh, there, there should be it, it nearly needs to be stated to demonstrate how ridiculous it is. Yes. And if any such accommodation should be made, any self-respecting player would leave the league and say, I'm, I'm not prepared to be associated with something like that. And that's how difficult the investors in South Africa, for example, uh, are players in our economic league. And if we expect them to take this league seriously, we cannot make special dispensations for people on the basis of skin color. Right. It's just never going to work. Uh, it's, it, it will lose credibility. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not in a uh, Alice in Wonderland type of uh, haze when I say that. Uh, if you look at the research, for example, on the European Union uh, Chambers of Commerce, mm. where, where they state their, what, what do they regard as the biggest obstacles? BEE is the single biggest obstacle to their investing in South Africa that they have to find. And in particular, the daunting requirement of finding black people of sufficient skill. Yeah. So, so, you know, who are we fooling? Mm. We, we, we can play around this and we can slice it any way we like. In the end, uh, it's not a serious economy if we, 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 we're making that kind of uh, false allowance for mm. people. Yeah, there's, you, you included a great quote from, I think it was, so sorry, we just had a little uh, interruption. Uh, I was just going to mention a quote that on page 43, um, you're quoting a guy, Stephen Carter, and he says, the best black syndrome creates in those of us who have benefited from racial preferences, a peculiar contradiction. We are told over and over that we are the best black people in our profession, and we are flattered. But to professionals who have worked hard to succeed, flattery of this kind carries an unsubtle insult. For we yearn to be called what our achievements often deserve, simply the best. No qualifiers needed. Mm, that's right. So, France, I mean, one, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, imagine what what someone at home who has a different opinion might be thinking. And I suppose mm. one opposing view might be that this is a necessary 
I don't want to say necessary evil, but certainly something necessary at this point in time mm-hmm. to transition into a, a place where one day we don't have to have mm-hmm. um, a quota a system and where we can give people opportunities based on merit. Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you do you think that's a legitimate point of view? What what are the problems with that or is that Yeah. You know, I've I've thought about that for a long time because it is it is a tempting argument, isn't it? I mean it, it seems it seems right. It's certainly a PC on the argument. Face, on the yeah. face of it, why should if it's true that black people are previously disadvantaged because of apartheid and so forth? What is wrong with a system where we allow uh, a special preference, uh, either by way of admission to university or by way of uh, promotions to posts or by appointments to posts or by uh, access to material wealth or now, lately, to property? Mm. What is wrong with a system like that <coughs> where we give... Uh, redistribution because that's really what it amounts to yeah um, ultimately people invest in the country they do so by way of property or by setting up businesses and what all these various rules do and the same applies to uh, labor law what all these rules do is they, they they effectively require of the privileged class who to a large extent still happen to be the white class to redistribute their wealth, their money, whatever it is, to the previously disadvantaged. The difficulty is how do we how do we ever determine that we have reached that point where justice is now served? Yes. And 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 it's it, it's it's going to be very mysterious and difficult to yeah because. To what we know we can't say is that everybody will be equal. Mm. That there will be equal outcomes for everyone. Right. Because there is no society in the world where there's equal outcome of material wealth or income or whatever the case may be. So equality of income is uh, non-existent. By the same token, equality of ability is non-existent. So people are always going to come to the party with different abilities. Someone will have better schooling, someone will have better genes, someone will be lucky enough to have grown up in a certain environment or a family or come from a country where certain things are done in a certain way and will have a benefit or an advantage over others. So there will never be equality. Mm. That means that we reach the stage where we want to say we want to second guess what the world would have looked like in the absence of discrimination. If, if, if Jan van Riebeek and his cronies and all their successors afterwards had not discriminated against black people in South Africa, what would it have looked like mm. if we had a perfect world of a perfectly ideal South Africa from a discrimination point of view? No colonial treatment, no discrimination, no dispossession of property, all of that. What would have happened Mm. to black people? Now, the person who says to me that he knows the answer to that is simply lying. There is just no way we could ever say how that would would have been. And what makes it more complicated, as we have discussed before, is, for example, just, just to name one example, when the colonists came to South Africa in, for arguments like 1652, they were already way ahead in the race. Mm. They were so far advanced in terms of their ability. I coined a phrase the other day which I call um, uh, capital in in the sense of your ability to to make money. Now that that ability, that money-making capital, which can include things like your natural endowment of IQ, your education, your networks of people you know, your technology that you command, your possessions. People came to Africa and they already had those advantages. Yeah. On such an immense scale that it's almost... It's an enormous scale. It's almost silly. I mean, Now, to say that 
we could assess the effect of that and compare it to the impact that we would have had if we had had no discrimination from the start. It's impossible. One example, if, if the colonists came to Africa in 1652 and treated everybody fairly, we would have had far more qualified black people who would have been able to work in the businesses of the colonists. We would have had far more wealthy black buyers who would have provided a market for the black colonists to which to sell their products. It would have been a far richer country, which means that the white people, the colonists, would have been far more wealthy in the result. They would have been far better off mm. because they would have been able to operate in this uh, ideal society where everybody was treated equally right. and had equal opportunities, equal education and equal income, ach, not equal income, e opportunities to get income. Mm. Now, how do we factor that in? Do you understand the, dis the difficulty? Uh, so it becomes impossible. Uh, you, 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 the mind starts boggling. And I say, well, it's a meaningless exercise. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how, how, how much longer can we have quota systems in place for and, and, and yeah, I mean, I mean, where does it, it stop? and where does it, and where, after, after 30 years, 40 years, 50 That's years, right. 60 and, and, and years, you see my difficulty a, a I mean, I mean, a hundred years down the line, if we still have quota systems, it'll be a kind of, it's a very strange yeah. Yeah. thing. And, 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 and the concern that, 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 that I have is this. In South Africa, it so happens that the majority of people belong to that class who now claims to be entitled to the benefit of redress. Now, the, the, the privileged class are mm. entitled at some point to say, how are we going to know that that point has arrived? where this mm. mystical achievement mm. yes. is reached, where we will all be endowed as we would have been endowed in the absence of discrimination over the last 350 years. Mm. Do you understand the difficulty? So, and who's going to judge that? Who's going to sit down and say, Mystically, we now know there's a formula yeah. which we can apply. Yeah, we've just bear in mind that formula has not been agreed. There's no, in fact, the very system that we have is one where that is shrouded in uncertainty. We don't know. Like, there is, do, do we draw the line when most people, you know, are able to, what, live in a house like in the southern suburbs? I mean, is that the line or... You see, the point is, the, is or house in Higovale, or yeah. I mean, I mean, it would it would probably have been better if we had had a standard like that. But the problem is, you can't you can't force the system, you can't manipulate the system to reach that point. Right. It may or may not succeed. Right. Uh, but the, the the fact of the matter is, we don't have that, and and why that is a bad idea. A terrible idea is because it then makes the determination of success an arbitrary process. Mm. It then makes it up to the discretion of some official somewhere to say, well, mystically we have now reached this goal. We have now made our uh, target and we can all relax. BEE is off the table, employment equity is off the table uh, and all the other things. Uh, Welfare payments. It's quite a, it's quite so a, it's quite a scary uh, sort of rabbit hole to go down. Imagining the sort of longevity of some of these policies and how sort of indefinite they may be. That's right, and and, and it was significant uh, that it was it was it was tentatively mentioned at the time of the negotiations uh, of the constitution and so on that there should be a, what is called a sunset clause. We don't have a sunset clause. There mm. is absolutely no way. And, and why it is terrible is by making the determination of success an arbitrary 
matter, an uncertain arbitrary matter, we have played into the hands of tyranny. Mm. Why? Because that is the very definition of tyranny. That's when the rule of law goes out the window. The rule of law is that ability that we know how we must conduct ourselves, how we must regulate our own behavior so that we comply with what the law requires. There is absolutely no way that the privileged class in this country knows how it must behave in order to comply. And the problem is the target keeps moving. Yeah, You see, that's how what we have seen. We saw it when it started with, uh, first it was just labor law, then it was employment equity mm. to try and rectify all these. Then it became, and I know labor law is ostensibly not about race, but uh, let's not fool ourselves. It's 99% of people who make use of those benefits in the active sense, the bad sense of the word as I've described it, as a rent-seeking exercise, are the, are the, are the, are the black employees. Um, and it's for no reason other than the fact that they, they're best able to use it. Mm. It's to, I almost want to say it's designed for that. Um, then we went on, the, none of those things worked, then we went on to, to, to formal uh, company-based black empowerment, that didn't work. Uh, the other thing we tried is uh, government uh, public service employment. I see Mr. Ramaphosa's uh, government has now announced that they want to increase government employment. That's one of the ways they want to fight unemployment, is by appointing more people to the public service, mm. which is draining our ability to create jobs in the private sector. Um, that has not worked. And then finally now the big debate is property. We're simply going to take the privileged people's property, it seems, and redistribute it to the rest, uh, so as to redress. Um, so the story I'm going to tell you now is, is sort of just building on what you're saying. Um, so I went up the, the mountain today and on my way down, um, I saw a father and there was a father and a son and I was running quite fast down and um, you could the, you could hear the water bottles in my bag and this guy said to me sounds like you have some water in your bag mm. so I slowed down and I said would you like some because mm. he didn't I mean we were we're coming this is like halfway up Plata Clip it's midday it's boiling outside it's been what 28 30 today mm. um, he's with his kid and the kids in jeans and sneakers like clearly not ready for a walk they have no water, they have no food. So I say, well, would you like some water? I mean, I can sense that's what he's asking for. So then I stop and he says, yeah, thanks a lot. I whip out the water bottle uh, and and he gives it to his son. And his son very nonchalantly, he doesn't greet me or anything, uh, just, start, just starts drinking it and then finishes the whole bottle and gives it back to his dad. And this kid's about 10 or 11 mm. and gives it back to his dad. Dad like, smiles at me, thanks a lot. And it's such a funny interaction because, because uh, look, I know we're on the mountain, whatever, but it just struck me that there was no thank you or there was no eye contact, there was no kind of appreciation or there was no, mm -hmm. and in that moment it almost felt like manners or politeness or this that realm of, of mm -hmm. being polite to one another almost didn't exist, mm -hmm. um, and it, it it sort of reinforced this thing that I've been thinking about recently, which is this this thing of. The, 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 the problem of not having certain aspects of life validated, mm -hmm. you know, so if, if you grow up in a household where people don't validate manners, mm. it, it's almost as if they don't exist. And so when you encounter people in the world, they sort of might look at you odd and you'll never really get why. It's because you're not saying thank you. You're not saying, you know what I mean? So it's like, it, I think it can apply to other things as well. And that's kind of where, where this comes back into the book is, you know, what happens... What happens if, if entrepreneurship is not validated or the, the, the um, importance of earning your own, earning your, paying your own way? Mm. The, and, and so yeah, I, I kind of want us to get into the, the, the entrep that entrepreneurial problem okay. that we experience yeah. Yeah. because I feel like it's, it's the culture of entrepreneurship is not being just like the culture of saying please and thank you mm. for that 
man and his son yeah. seemed like it hadn't been validated. Uh, yeah, mm. it feels like it's the, uh, the culture of entrepreneurship's not being validated in, yeah. in South Africa. It seems to me that what how we run a society is by creating structures, mm. and structures determine uh, our behavior, and they by creating incentives. Uh, when you came into this house, you, you came in through the front door. You didn't try and break through the wall. Mm. You came through, and the, the the front door structure has created the almost uh, inevitable incentive. You can't do otherwise. You, you That's where you come in. Um, so our structures will, will invariably produce the incentives that make people behave in certain ways. Now, to come back to your point, uh, by creating incentives to behave in a certain way, you punish other ways and you reward those ways. Mm. And if our system, our structure is such that it rewards rent-seeking, then our value that we place on meritorious behavior is non-existent. Uh, or, or greatly diminished. We don't we don't learn to value productivity uh, because we play the system. We, we, right. you, you can almost not blame the ordinary person out there. If the way to make a living in this country is to get a, an RDP house and sit at home with your as many children as you can, because for every child you get a separate welfare uh, check uh, if that is what is rewarded by way of these benefits we shouldn't be surprised when that affects the culture of entrepreneurship the, we yeah. shouldn't be because that is precisely what then happens so the 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 incentive is not there because it's not uh, it's not really necessary and uh, that then reinforces a culture because you continue to live that way. That becomes the way of life. Uh, I've, I've, I've discussed with you previously my experience of other countries in Africa mm. where these benefits do not exist. Um, and the poorest countries are invariably the ones with, with the l structures which least reward idleness uh, and unproductivity, lack of productivity in the sense of lack of entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, and where, where everybody is making a little living out of either um, growing fruit on his little patch of land or putting up a stall to service uh, welding or hairdressing or mm. dog walking or uh, some butchery or mm. anything, mm. whatever society wants, somebody is there to pre who's prepared to provide it, even if it's on a very small scale, yes, and to make a living out of that. Mm. And uh, that's not happening. Mm. South Africa has the lowest, um, probably the lowest percentage of entrepreneurship per economic active population of any country in Africa. It is desperately low. So, can I read something from mm. the book to kind of reinforce what you're saying? Um, this is on page 44. You, you write, uh, It is concerning that the attitudes of South Africans towards entrepreneurship are so far removed from those in other developing countries. So that's what I think is quite thought-provoking. I mean, regardless of the developed world, mm. just amongst the developing nations, we seem to be struggling. Mm. Um, here are the percentage of the population intending to start a business in South Africa compared to other African countries. And this is from the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor 2016-17 uh, global report. So we've got here, so this is entrepreneurial um, intentions. Um, we've got Burkina Faso, 63.7%, Cameroon, 34.4%, Egypt, 63.8%, uh, Morocco, 36.2%, and you've got South Africa, 10.1%. 10, 10 mm, mm. So the average is 49.5%, and we are at 10%. Yeah. Uh, percent. And then um, another interesting um, set, of, uh, set of numbers here is for 
uh, new business ownership, mm. the, the new business ownership rate. Burkina Faso, 13.5. Cameroon, 10.9. Egypt, 6.6. Morocco, 4.3. South Africa, 3.3. Mm. So the average is 8.8 .8 and we are at 3.3. Yeah. And that's new business ownership rate. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a shocking thing. I mean, there's another example which echoes that. It's the... Uh, uh, informal settlement, I think it's, is it Orange Farm or one of those, um, Dipslut, Dipslut in uh, Gauteng, where the, uh, the percentage of businesses owned by uh, foreign uh, inhabitants, in other words, the, uh, the typically illegal immigrants who come into the country and have no chance of getting welfare benefits, mm. Uh, those percentages are way ahead of the South Africans in terms of the number of businesses that they own. And, uh, you know, you, you have to start saying at some point, but there must be a reason for that. What, yeah. makes, what makes those people different? So, so do you think that the... I mean, one of the glaring... One of the glaring uh, the sort of elephants in the room is the... is, is our... Is our our history of inequality, mm. uh, which is which is sort of unraveled on such a profound level, mm. and it just, you know, I, I was traveling in Scotland recently, uh, visiting family, and really kind of just so taken aback at how, I don't know, just modern and and mm. how 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 well it functions and runs mm. and how rich in culture and history it is. Um, but it did, and and it's interesting because I I'm even though even though I I, I definitely am, am, am would consider would be considered to be a privileged person in South Africa. Mm. It's interesting because you go to Europe, and that privilege is really put in perspective. Because over mm. there, you really see what privilege is like. Mm -hmm. And I, I I felt this. I felt a hint of that inequality that existed, for example, between me. And these and these 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 Scottish people, because mm -hmm. they they were living in in they were li they live in sort of like decades in front of us, mm -hmm. maybe even I don't know centuries, um, where things just run so well. They're sort of living con in constant surplus. Mm -hmm. You know, um, trains arrive on time. Crime there's crime is sort of absent, and everyone's just sort of enjoying life and building and thriving and flourishing mm -hmm. and. And it does create this funny feeling in you, the sense of almost sort of a, a defeat, mm. sort of, I'll, I'll never get there. How mm. will, you know, yeah. do, you, do you think the, the inequality in South Africa, um, I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to say yes, but I'd love to hear why. Like, how, do, how does that inequality in South Africa contribute so uniquely to this, mm. to this, this culture we find ourselves having to kind of pick up and yeah I, I suspect what we have to recognize is that there's a historical uh, inequality is for obvious reasons vast what worries me is that since 1994 when everything was going to be supposed to turn for the better mm. uh, if you compare white income to black African income in particular leave aside for the moment the other two minority groups, uh, in Indian and, and, and the colored groups. Those two groups on average have in fact grown further apart. The gap, income gap in absolute terms between those two groups has in fact increased. And that yeah, is I mean, terribly a, worrying. Uh, when, I can, I when I first saw that statistic, I mean, it mm, was really quite something. I it it, it I is really, it it's now. really uh, depressing. The reason, of course, is unemployment. And that's why I am so confident in pushing this argument that when I say that BEE is bad for us, I don't mean it's bad for the rich people, the white people who have to give up. Yeah, they. It is bad for the unemployment. It grows that army of unemployed people. Why? Coming back to rent seeking where we started, it breaks down the productivity. It's not as productive. Uh, we're, we're not. So in other words, we're not. We're not 
the, 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 we're not making the cake big enough for the people at the bottom. That's right. We, yeah. we need to be able to grow businesses. And we, we're going about it in the worst possible way by misallocating resources based on skin color. That's got to affect the ability of all those businesses to create jobs, let alone the ability of investors to find new, found new businesses. Hmm. That has to be affected. Uh, take one example. It's a very harsh example, but BEE and the agricultural sector, which is now once again very topical. There was a survey done by the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, hardly uh, foaming at the mouth right-wingers. Uh, found that productivity in Limpopo on the farms, which were subject to BEE projects, productivity dropped by 89%. No way, that's crazy. That is... Uh, it's, I mean, that should terror... That should in that part of the people. world, Limpopo and Pumalanga, parts of the agricultural sector have been destroyed because of BEE. Jeez, it's it's obvious, there's a massive mismatch with the merit principle. People are just not able to step into those positions. And no matter how you slice and dice it, even if you if you employ resources to train people up, then that means you have to take the resources from somewhere, which will then be uh, leave a gap somewhere else. So the only way to Im best improve this is to have the most efficient allocation of resources across the board. And that can only happen in terms of economic theory by having as few limitations as possible, mm. as few restrictions as possible on the allocation of resources. So, for example, if, if someone is prepared to buy land in which to invest as a, as a farmer in an, in an agricultural product, that person, to use the nice... Uh, timely colloquial expression will have skin in the game you go into your farm and you know i better make a success of this so if i can't make it work because i don't have the skills myself as a farmer then i'm for goodness sake going to make sure that i get somebody who who knows what he's doing and yes. I'll, I'll pay him an appropriate salary all right i'll hire the best person to be the manager of my farm because I have skin in this, my money. Mm. Now, if you want to take away property rights, you, you, you rip the floor from under the merit principle in property. Because so what you say is uh, the, best, the best solution is no longer going to, the most productive solution is not going to be rewarded. We have a, we're going to have a, an allocation on, on the basis of skin color. And that's just sad. It's going to 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 do hurt. Do you do you the unemployed? Do you think? Uh, I I feel like there is a profound um, lack of vision, um, not just in not just amongst um, the the leaders of this country, but even amongst um, I want to say amongst young people who just in the way that you can see in the way they conduct themselves. There's, there's a there's almost like, particularly in the, in the way people protest, it's almost like people haven't thought about um, and the kind of end game we want to be mm. playing. Mm. You know, I mean, when you fin I'm sure you're familiar with that term, end game. So mm. the thing that you arrive at and then you keep doing that. Mm. Um, so, so for example, why I say you see it in young people is you see some of the kind of the, the, the emergence of like, these the, of of, um, of of racist re rhetoric, mm. and and you sort of begs the question. It's like, is that is that your is that your end game? Mm. Is that the mm. is that the way we want to be talking in the end game? Mm. Surely mm. not. Surely it's more like a Mandela vision where we move past race. Um, yeah. And I feel I feel like I feel like not. It, it's not just. Uh, because of rent seeking and also you can see it in the the at one point you detail the appalling education system we have uh, you see it in the the lack of attention being given to education mm. there's a there's a sense that we're not willing to sacrifice anything now for the future we mm. er, there's a there's a sort of there's a desire to have everything now and mm. now it's and and so we're we're almost acting constantly on whims 
Yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think of that? I, I, I understand it. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're, not, we're not sacrificing anything now for the future. Yeah. We're not no, I understand that. And yeah. the, the reason is that is, that is part of what rent seeking cre- creates. It creates a culture. And unfortunately, we have had the best examples of our politicians. Mm. Uh, politicians and officials in high places have set the structure and the culture in terms of which it's okay to milk the system. Right. Uh, To come back to your original example of the cake, it's okay to take slices out of the cake without growing the cake. Mm. Uh, Whereas a a healthy business environment will be one where you grow the cake and get rewarded accordingly. So you always put in more than you take out or your, your, your reward is commensurate with the productivity that you put in. Mm. But this, the culture and the structure that we have developed in this country is a, a notion that there's an endless supply. So we just need to milk the system for as long as possible. And uh, It's a very complacent attitude. It is, yeah. it is, it is such an attitude and it's, a, it's an attitude which is extremely destructive because it spreads. Uh, why should... Uh, the, it causes resentment. You know, I, I, always, I always argue this point. People say to me, but, but all these rent-seeking structures, at least they create um, social stability. To which I say no. Because if, look at what's happening on the streets today. On the streets you have delivery protests, you have violent strikes, you have people looting and burning shops, burning tires, blocking roads. Why? resentment because they don't have and don't tell me it's because they don't want to use the opportunities i believe it is because the structure has created a culture where they see other people the elite taking and milking the system and i honestly believe that that is the that is the reason. Uh, if we can change our system to one where we start, even if they are modest, but we start seeing rewards from hard work and productivity mm. and studying and so on. But in a way, I, I, don't, I don't want to go and say I don't blame people because we should always blame people who, who steal and loot and burn. But one understands that there is an incentive in the system yes. because it creates resentment, um, and 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 that must be removed. So 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 the f- one of the things that must happen, and, and I'm, I, I'm, I, I, we can only trust that our reconstituted government will now bring about a, a, a change to the corruption, uh, for example, and that people who, who, who steal. Uh, directly or indirectly uh, or, or rooted out mm. but um, it's it's a massive ship to turn uh, concerns is, isn't it sad to see that even at um, my old high school which is where your kids went mm. um, <laughs> there's now this uh, story that's emerged of yeah. uh, 2.4 million rand being yeah. uh, stolen yeah. so if, I mean it really is everywhere yeah, it is. It yeah. is, and and the longer it continues, the more pervasive it becomes. Because everybody is saying, but so many other people are doing it, and 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 the, the it almost the so-called leaders are doing. And it almost, you know, what, you know what it reminds me of. It it reminds me of the the problem of doping in sports. Mm. It's sort of you know, it's sort of the the culture is is such that ordinary people would never cheat, mm. justify it because. It's the only way you can compete. You know, mm. it's the only way of ge- of getting a uh, a place in the top ten in the Tour de France or That's right. any kind of race. Um, yeah, it becomes the the becomes the, new, the culture, the, the, the new normal. It yeah. becomes the standard. Yeah. And uh, how to turn that around uh, is and, is really difficult. And, and but I, I but, but you know, we I, must decide decide what what is the most efficient way to turn it around. And I think France, on on top of all that, what what I think makes it what what I think makes it so much more problematic is that it 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 over time, all our efforts with all our all our social efforts to eliminate racism, mm. 
I think I'm concerned that they're being undermined by the... Uh, this is what your books made me realize. They seem to be... They're constantly undermined mm. by these economic forces mm. which will ultimately exacerbate some mm. of the prejudices that people already have yes. and which we're working so hard to eliminate. Yeah. But I mean, if, if people can, if, if unemployment, um, if unemployment increases or if you have even more people on social grants year in and year out, um, an increasing culture of dependency, I don't see it boding well for, mm. for social cohesion at all. Or Yeah, so, so um, the obvious question that we all ask ourselves is, 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 is how do you, how do you turn the chip and, and, and uh, something which has occupied my mind for years um, because people tend to want to rectify culture by talking about it. They say we must inculcate a culture and, 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 and then they employ consultants and they employ facilitators and we have all sorts of workshops and seminars and things where we talk about this. Um, I don't don't see that as working. I'm, I think of it almost as a from an economist perspective, mm. and that is that, as I said earlier, structures create incentives to behave in a certain way, and that in turn creates experience. And unless you can change that, you have to. Uh, okay, so so we just had a brief interruption. So. Um, I'm going to start with the economist. The way I look at it is from the perspective almost of an economist. And that is that it is structures that create the incentives to behave in a certain way. Mm. And it is only by creating the incentives that we change experience. Yes. People, people will not experience the benefits of working productively unless we have a system in place with structures that actually reward uh, working productively. Why, why else would people do mm. that? People mm. are human. Uh, it's like it's, and, and if yeah. you reward rent-seeking, then people are going to, to make use of that. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I'm saying is that the way to, to, to change this, the, the only way I can see this changing is, is at the top level. Now, here comes the, the curveball. It's a little matter of democracy. We have a democratic system in which our president, for example, is walking on eggs. He's doing a balancing act because his own power base in the party is threatened by every time he moves to reconfigure the structure so as to change the incentives towards a more productive system he's threatening a vested interest. Because there are so many vested interests in the form of rent seekers that uh, his entire power base is beleaguered by that. Mm. So he has to patiently consolidate his position by removing each one of these interest groups one at a time. Mm. And uh, that's why I have sympathy for the viewpoint that he's playing a long game. Uh, whether he sees it that way is then further complicated by the fact that he himself may believe some of these rent-seeking structures are good. And that uh, I have no answer to. For example, as an ex-trade unionist, uh, I believe that he, he must believe that some of these things are good. Uh, he, I don't know what he really thinks about restructuring the property market, mm. uh, expropriation without compensation. He says he believes it, but is that a political game or does he really believe it? So that's the second dimension. Uh, right. But I do believe that the way to, to, to change it is then to say, well, let's experiment on a small scale with some of these. Yes, because set up special little zones. structures, yeah, little economic zones or school projects or house building projects where some of these meritorious, merit-based 
are structures practiced. are tested and we say well because yeah, I, I mean that's such a reasonable yeah. approach i think now let me let me say to you why i think there's hope because we've we've really uh, yeah, lambasted I'm, 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 ourselves. I must and I must say, um, after my trip to Scotland, yeah. I definitely need you need some. I need something to, okay. to keep me here. Let me tell you the the Institute for Race Relations every year comes out with a couple of surveys, uh, and they've now they've now hit a little nerve because they've suddenly realised that. If we are in a democracy, then maybe it, it is worth determining what the people really want. And what I have found, what they have found, like a constant theme that comes through all the time, is people, ordinary voters out there, are not worried about racism. They don't complain about racism in their lives. That's the biggest problem. And they don't complain about property. Those two yeah. are way down the list of priorities. Right. The two things which come out all the time as high priority are unemployment or employment as the converse and education. Because ordinary people out there have no truck with this nonsense that uh, we must play around with quotas and affirmative action and BEE. So who? So the, the basic question is, who? who is concerned with all that stuff? I believe there's a tiny little political elite. Uh, unfortunately, they're the ones with access to the social media and to the media yeah. who are driving the process and where the debate is loudest. It's interesting because it, it bears such striking resemblance to the relationship. I'm reading a book right now uh, called The Strange Death of Europe mm. by Douglas Murray. Have you heard oh, yes. about this? Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, I haven't read it. But yeah, it's, I'll give it to you when I'm done. It's a really interesting read. And at one, he, at one point he talks about a similar relationship between the majority of people's opinions about immigration and mm. the small elite political elites who are making decisions totally in opposition to what the majority of people want mm, mm. and it's a it's a it really brings into question how we mm. for me at least it brings into question how we i don't know relate to our democracy what it even means uh yeah and is that is that kind of what you're speaking to i, th I think so it uh, because it brings back the the topic of interest groups uh, I mean, if, if the majority of people aren't concerned about land and, and aren't concerned about quotas, yeah, then surely we should. That's right. Do away with. But but such of course, uh, the political system is, is is set up in such a way that uh, politicians are prepared to uh, exploit any dispute, which they can, in order to enhance their own position, and that is why you will find that. Uh, the worse the government fares in terms of creating an environment for job creation and education to flourish, the more they uh, focus on racism, the more they focus on uh, redistribution of property, the more they focus on employment equity, right. black economic empowerment, and all of these right. things, because that makes for easy leverage to get votes. Yeah, um, yeah. and. I have uh, the other terrible frustration, which 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 I've, I've I've just not understood it. Why the Democratic Alliance has not made it there, front, center, and everywhere, main plank of their election campaign to drive the employment point. Why is that not the be all in the end all of the employment in and education. That's what people are worried about. And you you look in vain for a courageous attack on the current employment system. You look in vain for a courageous attack on the current education system. Yeah, they talk this way and that way and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But they want to be everything to everybody instead of saying the vast majority of their voters are people who are poor 
We'll sit out in the townships. And the second question is, why on earth are they not camping out in the townships? Why is there, don't they have their base in the townships in a manner of speaking? You know, I know they do. They, they have outreaches and they have meetings and they have all sorts of rallies and so on. But these must be courageous, principle-based uh, drives that mm -hmm. say, listen, this is how it works. Yeah. These powerful politicians are taking your jobs away. They are causing the unemployment. You have to vote them out because they put in place those laws which right. are destroying your jobs. They put in place those laws which make, for example, SATU. It's an exceptionally good example of rent-seeking. SATU, the South African Democratic Teachers Union, an all-powerful, I want to say, blood-sucking parasite in our education system. They sit there and they milk the system for all it's worth. Some of them run schools. The trade union is running schools in some cases. And I'm talking about government uh, commissions of inquiry, which have shown that they buy and sell principals' positions. Not to even mm -hmm. mention the low-level uh, mismanagement that is going on in our schools, but all of which is the result of a stranglehold, which is... Uh, hostile to the very merit principle. Right. I mean, if ever there's a place where you want merit to be the sole guiding load star, that must be schools. And uh, it's almost the worst part of our system, is our education. So those two uh, cornerstones to me would, because you know what? If you can show that you are in good faith attacking the system as a political party, I cannot imagine that you will not get millions of voters. You must. But you'll have to go out there and you have to take your courage in your hand because you'll have, goodness knows, you're going to have an enemy. And that enemy is the trade union system. They're going to hate your guts. Mm. But you'll have to have the courage to take them on. Yeah. And what I see is they are too lily-livered and scared. They don't want to take on these vested interests. Uh, it's wow. scandalous uh, because they are letting the weak people down, the Fra poor people. Franz, I feel like that's a good um, point to start wrapping up. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, even though it's quite a, uh, a, a negative note. Uh, I think, well, I think, I'm, I think I'm it's, hoping to give you a plan. Yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, but uh, I think the, yeah, the, the, that's what I take away the, mm. that that education, unemployment, mm. and uh, a merit-based system, mm. um, or at least uh, would make would make a, a great a great start. In, in, uh, I think so. Just to 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 bring the sort of close the circle on yes. the unemployment story. Mm. At the moment, we're not going to fix the education system in a year or in a five years. It's going to take decades to fix it completely. For the moment, the system is putting out inexperienced, unqualified, uneducated learners into the jobs market. You can't even, you can't even send... Uh I mean, I was working at a small design agency not long ago, and mm. you know, when we were getting some new hires, um, regardless of skill and 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 all that, it just 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 the, the ability to email, mm. the ability to show up for an interview, the ability to dress appropriately, or, or you know, it's like or describe something in in, 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 in good English. Yeah, yeah. So that so that they can communicate. Yeah, but I mean the ba the basics. You know? And and now. So the point I'm making is those people, we've, we've now been told through these surveys, they want work and we want them to be productive. Now the only way that can work is by having a merit-based system where we match their low skills with what the market wants. And there's the only one way of doing that. And that is by giving them complete freedom. 
So they can say, to, well, to, to, to contract. Set, to set their own uh, wages. Yeah, the parties must set their own wages, their own terms and conditions of employment. Uh, either we say well, they must contract out of the system, or we say uh, we just remove the system. Either way. But uh, they must be able to be employed as cheaply as possible. Uh, they must be paid what they are worth in terms of their low productivity. So we must come back to the merit principle. Mm. And that way we will uh, create, uh, uh, create employment and we will suddenly find that we potentially have 9 million more people making things mm. and delivering services. Right. It With will be such an injection yeah. uh, because we will to come back to the so image you, of the you, machine. So do you think, I mean, do you think that that, that simple change hmm. would be like a, not an overnight success, but a, would, would certainly be an overnight injection of I, stimulus I, to the, for the I economy? I think so. Do you, you know, the same politicians who complain about the over-concentration of our business world, the over-investment in uh, capital, you know, we invest in machines. Why? Because we can't employ people. Those same people are pushing these, these laws. And the point is, these laws make it impossible. And I'm not only limiting my remarks to labor laws. It's, it's BEE, employment equity, and all these other things. Mm. Uh, combined, lower the productivity levels and deny the merit principle. I, I think what will happen is the moment it becomes acceptable to employ people at wages which pays for their actual productivity. Employers and investors will start thinking of ways that they can actually have low skill employment. Mm. At the moment it's not an option. We don't think of low skill employment. I, if people are not able to justify this expensive package, which is labor law based, yeah. they don't get employed. So why would we bother? Um, think of, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, one of the exceptions that, that we've made in this country through some loophole is parking attendance. Remember we used to have uh, automated parking meters. I don't remember that. Yeah, before your time. We used mm. to have Parking meters where you, you you put change in, and then once a month somebody would collect. Once a week someone would collect the money from the machine, and someone had the good sense of starting to employ parking attendants who get rewarded on the basis of the amount of money that they collect. They get paid a certain fee or a percentage based on how much they collect. So if they don't collect a lot of money, now they don't get paid a lot. They, I think they classify as independent contractors because they are not employees. They don't get a minimum wage. Now there is a very good example of a tiny little island of merit-based, because they, they, they own their keep. Mm. They, they rent out parking space in effect. They, the car stops next to the road and they come and they give the person a ticket uh, so much for so many hours and they get paid an amount and then from that they go and queue up at the end of the day at the office and they get paid an amount based on the uh, mm. collections that they've done for that day. Right. Now, now that's a perfectly sound low skill because it doesn't take in a huge amount of skill. Uh, low skill, um, call it labor system. But they're not paid, because they're not paid wages and because they in fact work for themselves, I think they, they classify as independent contractors, mm. so they escape the stranglehold of the labor system. Now, think of what you can do. For example, agriculture, infrastructure building, house building. Mm. These are all potentially low-skill work activities. You can, there, are, there are systems in construction, for example, where you can have low-skill uh, workers. Mm. But at the moment, it's not it's not on. Mm. 
you have to have these fancy machines that do all the pouring and the transport of the materials and because to have just ordinary old-fashioned labor of uh, unskilled workers is not cost-effective. Mm. And the same applies to agriculture, the same applies to um, mining to some extent. Uh, all of the big job creators mm. and infrastructure, I mean road building, dams, we, we, we should be able to, to, to employ people for next to nothing. Right. So that they will at least have a living. They will have food to eat. And they will learn over time. And they will learn. They'll they will be, improve their skills. And, and they will learn to work in a work also, environment. And also, so I mean, a ton of things. So you've got, they're, they're making m money. Sure, it's not a lot, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. They are learning new skills. They're also learning how to manage their time. You know, the whole lot of life skills but besides everything. the work skills. And then, and then, a, and then a number, another thing which I think is really great is that they're also developing a network. Yeah. You know, if you can work a bit here, work a bit there, build up a network, meet new people. Mm. But if you have no access yeah. whatsoever, and how, can you, how can you be expected and to if form you, a network? If you're lucky enough to, work, to be in a work environment and you come from, uh, let's say, the Eastern Cape or Limpopo, the remote or rural part. You might start out to someone who can't even speak English. There yeah. they are, they are thousands of people like that who can't even speak the language. If they can be employed on a low skill basis, they will then be exposed to those opportunities. They will mm -hmm. learn languages. They might even be lucky and get training on the job. They might get uh, adult education. Mm. Uh, and they will learn skills. They will learn how to... Uh, lay bricks, uh, do woodwork, uh, do welding, whatever it is that is done in that workplace. But take them out of that, and there's nothing. Mm. They sit at home and they receive a. They make, they get more uh, uh, welfare checks, and uh, they get a, an RDP house, and um, they do nothing. So, so it's all about employing people on merit. I think it's a great uh, note to end on. Thanks, okay. France, once again for a uh, great chat. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, in, in the in the actual chapter. I mean, we kind of talked we talked in and out of it and around it, mm. and uh, but there's a lot more uh, really striking statistics for people to read through, and some also some really nice quotes from from other people. Um, yeah, once again, uh, this is Franz Rodenbach, and today we've looked at the third chapter, Rent Seeking which is um, the third chapter of South Africa Can Work, France's book. Thank you. Which uh, I'm just a massive fan of. So, Thank France, you, I look forward to the next uh, video where we're going to be looking at, what's it? Um, the free market bulwark against, bulwark against rent-seeking. Yeah, that's like the, the, the opposite. Uh, what, 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 is the, what is the international evidence for, for, call it the merit system, because that's really what the free market is. I see. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Cool.